Good evening, I'm Lee Wright. I'm the founder of History Camp. I'm near Boston and with me tonight in Virginia is... Hi, I'm Carrie Lund. I'm the director of The Pursuit of History, the nonprofit that brings these History Camp discussions to you every week. One quick note as we get started, we will be showing a number of maps tonight of Gettysburg, so you may want to expand your screen to the full screen size so that you can see those as well as possible. Now, we are excited to welcome Kent Masterson Brown joining us tonight. Kent is an award-winning writer and attorney in Lexington, Kentucky. He is the president of Witnessing History Education Foundation, which creates documentaries about American history, leads tours, and more. He is the author of several books and joins us tonight to discuss his latest book, Mead at Gettysburg, A Study in Command. Thank you so much for joining us, Kent. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Carrie. Well, <clears throat> Uh, Ken, let's let's start by putting uh, not just uh, uh, Meade, but this effort in historical context. Uh, some have characterized this as kind of resurrecting uh, Meade's reputation, correcting the historical record. Tell us more about uh, what the perception has been and what led you to spend the years researching this and putting this together. Well. Uh of course, the, the perception of Meade over the years since um, the war, really, since Gettysburg, um, uh, has never been very uh, favorable. Uh, uh, he, um, he came under fire during the latter stages of the Gettysburg campaign. And uh, unfortunately for him, the fire came from the president of the United States, um, Abraham Lincoln who um, kept uh, uh, claiming that Lee was, uh, that Meade was dragging his feet in his pursuit of Lee's army, that by Meade following a parallel course in order to intercept Meade's army was evidence of his refusal to confront Lee. And that <clears throat> by he allowing Lee to cross the Potomac River on the um, wee hours of the 14th of July. Uh, he somehow uh, failed to grasp the fact that he had had a golden opportunity to, quote, destroy the enemy, end quote. Um, and uh, he let uh, that golden opportunity slip by. And um, uh, no matter what, uh, was said by Henry Halleck, the chief of staff, equivalent of chief of staff of the army, later to Meade, uh, which were very warm letters. And um, it didn't cover for the uh, bitterness that was engendered by Lincoln's statements. And sadly for George Meade, because it was the president of the United States who was making those remarks, many of the subordinates of George Meade uh, kind of fell into line. And um, even to the point where by November 1863, this is only months after Gettysburg, Meade wrote his wife, Margaret, uh, stating that uh, sooner or later it will be that I was never even at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, I, I came across, right after the book came out, um, a, a letter. This was a, one of my readers, but he lives in Canada, um, was a collector of ephemera. This letter's never been seen before, and so you're getting to hear it for the first time right here. Um, this, this is a letter George Meade writes to uh, John Batchelder, who was the original historian of the Battle of Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Campaign. Uh, in the 19th century. And um, uh, he writes this from his uh, headquarters, 3rd Military District in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1868. This is two years before he died. And this is what he says to Batchelder. <clears throat> he says, the vagaries of the battle did not permit of my keeping, in all cases, copies of my orders. Uh, uh, and the greater part of my orders were made verbally through staff officers. I find the same difficulty in all battles in which I commanded 
That is the impracticability of defining my exact position by a written record. It is this fact which causes, as you say, my name to appear so seldom in the elaborate communications that have been made uh, to you by my subordinates, some of whom I am well aware do not desire to mention my name. Nevertheless, if you're the, of the opinion that the truth of history requires my being ignored in this battle, I do not know any action on my part to remedy that evil. Imagine that. This is the, this is the victor of the largest land engagement in the history uh, ever on the North American continent. And yet he's reduced to that. And um, that would never remedy itself in his lifetime. His son would come out a, with a book called With Meade at Gettysburg. And his son was one of his staff officers, George Meade. And, um, uh, but that would be it in terms of any sort of uh, attempts to try to resurrect what George Meade did in that battle and in that campaign. And um, when I, back in 2005, I published a book called Retreat from Gettysburg. And in preparing that book, researching it and writing it, uh, I gained a healthy respect for George Meade. And so when that book came out and it, had, it did very well, still does, uh, Chapel Hill, my publisher, asked me, what would you want to do next? And I said, uh, George Meade. I think he deserves uh, a book uh, just on his, this campaign the Gettysburg camp. So that's really what got me in it was well, I felt for the man. The book has been, been so well received. Congratulations. Thank and you. I'm delighted to be able to talk with you about it tonight. Yeah. Um, in the run up to Gettysburg, was the perception that this was going to be this incredibly important, this pivotal war in or pivotal battle rather, series of battles in the Civil War? Well, I think you have to say yes to that. Uh, mainly because this is as far into Union territory as the principal army of the Confederacy uh, was able to, to reach. And uh, the elements of Lee's army went as far as York, went as far as the Susquehanna River. Uh, many of them went as far north as Carlisle, some threatening Harrisburg. Um, that's serious stuff. And you've got an army. It's not just any army. Uh, this is the same army commanded by Robert E. Lee um, that had defeated the Army of the Potomac in every engagement in which the two fought, a every one of them. From 1861, the forerunner of the Army of the Potomac was defeated at first Manassas. And then once the Army of the Potomac was created and sent to the, the peninsula in the spring of 62, uh, it was defeated there. It was, de it was defeated then against at Second Manassas. Then it was its attacks at, uh, at Antietam were all defeated. Uh, the people call that battle a, a draw, but the Army of the Potomac was the active one, the aggressor, and it failed. And also the costliest battle ever fought in American history, one day battle ever fought in American history. And then you get to Fredericksburg, which is an utter disaster, as was Chancellorsville all Confederate victories. And now this army is on your territory and it's running deep into your territory. And it's actually threatening Baltimore, uh, at least in the minds of those in Washington, believe that Washington and Baltimore were threatened. So yeah, they figured that at some point when this, when the two armies have to collide, it's going to be probably the one battle that will decide things one way or the other. Now, what was what was Meade's uh, reputation in in the lead up to this? He he took command only three days before the battle. Was the perception that this was uh, was someone who had all of the skills needed at this pivotal time? Well, I think so. Um, he Meade is a um, he's forty seven years old. He um, uh, is uh, twenty seven years out of West Point. 
he um, uh, has had a solid career in the Army, initially as a um, uh, topographical engineer, but uh, in the Civil War as first a brigade commander, then a division commander, and by November 1862, a corps commander, commander of the Fifth Corps of the Army of the Potomac. And as a tactical officer, he was as good as they get, truly. Hard, hard working, um, um, uh, uh, aggressive sort of commander, but also one who um, tries and it succeeds in not making mistakes. And um, he's very conscious of <clears throat> what happens to a command when you make an error in judgment. And we have one of those not on his part, but on one of his principal subordinates that precipitates the Battle of Gettysburg, an error in judgment. And um, so this is a solid man. And I think when, when he was named commander of the army on June 28, only three days before the battle began, uh, in Frederick, uh, he was named in Frederick, Maryland, which was where the Army of the Potomac was located when he was named. Um, most of those corps commanders, division commanders, uh, accepted that appointment with, um, with some relief that we now have a solid soldier whose life is being a soldier. And uh, that's... And, and, and they respected what they had seen of George Meade all the way up until then. So, yeah, I think there was a lot of relief among the officers. Now, down in the ranks, it was a, a little different. You know, the common soldier, um, he, uh, he reacts differently than the officers all the time. And many of them... Um, you know, he was the Google-eyed old snapping turtle that uh, uh, Meade was once told by his one of his subordinates, his men called him, and um, uh, and they were in love with George McClellan. You know, even on even during the Gettysburg campaign, as they were moving north from Frederick, there were rumors that McClellan had now come into the ranks and he's going to be the commander. Um, but apart from the rank and file soldier. Uh, uh, he was well received among the officers, and that's where it really counted. And, and that appointment was it uh, was it believed that we were just on the eve of this this major clash? Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, the Lincoln and Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, and um, Henry Halleck, the equivalent of a chief of staff. They, they had wanted to change commanders ever since um, the Battle of Chancellorsville, which is in early, early May. And they had kind of wasted a lot of time fiddling with it. The first real uh, opportunity they, they had to interview any commander was apparently John Reynolds, who was supposedly interviewed on the 2nd of June. Uh, he told me later that he turned it down. He didn't want to pick up the leavings of, of Hooker and Burnside, the two prior commanders. Whether that is all, whether that's actually the way it occurred or not, that's the way it's come down to us. Uh, but other than that, they had done nothing. And in the meantime, Lee had continued to move on into Pennsylvania. And so by uh, June 27, it was a crisis. They literally waited until a crisis, and the crisis was so so uh, so uh, 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 looming on them so much that instead of they asking to talk with George Meade, they sat down and they crafted an order, uh, a peremptory order, for Meade to become commander, and told him through their emissary, who was sent James Hardy, uh, General Hardy was sent out there with the order uh, to Frederick. Uh, they told him that we will not accept a no. He is being ordered to do it. And um, if he disobeys the order, well, you can only imagine 
There is no way for him to get out. And um, when Meade was interrupted around three in the morning by Hardy and told him he has some, quote, bad news, uh, Meade asked him, am I, am I under arrest? <laughs> He says, my, my mind is clear of anything that I could have done. I mean, I, my mind is clear, but am I under arrest? That's, that's how bad it had gotten. And here you are three days now. They didn't know it would be three days, but it was three days before the fighting would begin. And that's how Meade's name commander. And, and what was his reaction when he finally got that news? And then why don't we go then from there over those following few days and the right. beginning of, of, the, of the battle. Sure. Um, he, Meade was nothing but gracious in finally, once he learned what they had in mind for him and that he was being named commander of the Army of the Potomac. He had talked with his wife through letters about the possibility of he being commander. And frankly, uh, Margaret, his wife, really didn't want to see that happen. Too many people had been... Uh, their, their careers had been destroyed, really, by commanding that army. But Meade, Meade took it, immediately got to work, did nothing but map work for the rest of that day. Um, uh, and um, what he did by the end of that day, he had an order already crafted for the army to move north. And uh, his, um, uh, and I, I, I describe it in the, in the book this way, Meade, as he's looking at the maps, and by the way, um, Meade has no topographical maps of any of the counties in Maryland or Pennsylvania he's going to operate in. Uh, instead, what they're using are old residential maps. These are maps that were created by uh, commercial enterprises. People's names along the highways could be seen. And that's how when I discovered this by going through Meade's orders, and he would he would tell you, where on the road to turn west or east based upon the name of some resident at the Jones's place, I want you to bear to the left. And I kept saying, where is this coming from? You know, how does he know the Jones's place? Well, I ordered all reproductions of all those maps and there they all were. And, um, but what he does in looking at that map and getting what intelligence he had, which was basically this, that there are elements of Lee's army at Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, in the Cumberland Valley. There are elements of the army in advance of Chambersburg at Cashtown in the, at, at the pass uh, uh, through the uh, uh, South Mountain Range, about eight miles west of Gettysburg. And then there are elements of the army as far east as York, Pennsylvania. And there are elements of Lee's army south of Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Now, all of those troops appear to be either on or just north of a turnpike that runs from Chambersburg through Cashtown through Gettysburg and on to York. And that Chambersburg to York turnpike, as I refer to it in the book, appears to be the axis on which all of Lee's army is operating. So what Meade determines to do is move his army as close to that axis as he can, but also obey the orders given to him. And that those orders stated that you can do what you wish offensively, but you must always be in a position to defend Baltimore and Washington. So as he moves north and this whole army on the 29th of June, moves more than 32 miles uh, north in order to get into a position that he's, he looks at on those maps that appears to be the right position that, that allows him to do what he wants to do with the enemy, but also cover Baltimore and Washington. And that was a stream that runs into the Monocacy River called Pipe Creek. Uh, it's actually two creeks, Big Pipe Creek and Little Pipe Creek, and it's Big Pipe Creek he can see on the maps. And as he gets to towns like Middleburg, Maryland, in um, Carroll County, 
um, Tanny Town in, <clears throat> uh, in, in um, uh, Carroll County, Maryland. Uh, as he's reaching these towns that are on that Pipe Creek line, uh, he sees that on the south bank of Pipe Creek, uh, the, the, uh, the bank is immense. It could run from anywhere from 100 feet above the level of the, of the stream uh, on, the, on, the, on the east uh, uh, element of, this, of the stream. And as you move west, it might reduce to 50 feet above the surface of the stream, down to 25 feet above the surface of the stream as you get near Middleburg, uh, of Maryland. Now, that's a heck of a defensive position to be in if you can hold it, if you can hold your troops there and, and incite the enemy to come after you. And that's the key here. Uh, he would want to defend Baltimore and Washington, but also invite the enemy to him. And there were means by which you could do that. And by the way, these means are st still the same in army doctrine today. And that is you send out what we call an advanced corps or multiple corps. Uh, maybe anywhere from 10 to 15 miles ahead of you. And you have them get onto a, a, a road or route of communication of the enemy and invite the enemy then to try to collect in front of you. And when it does, you then begin a withdrawal and you withdraw back to the line you want to defend. Uh, General Hancock, during the hearings on Meade's uh, command of the army in the Gettysburg campaign, referred to Meade's operation as a mask. Those elements move ahead and mask what you're planning to do, but invite the enemy to attack them. And um, uh, that's what he had set up. And, and again, by the way, that is still army doctrine. Uh, even though you've got satellite reconnaissance and all of this these days, still you've got to cause the enemy to do something um, and make the enemy react to you. Um, and that's what Meade's intentions were. Uh, it's to defend Pipe Creek. Uh, believe me, he had no interest in opening a battle at Gettysburg. He didn't even know anything about Gettysburg. He even confessed, I do nothing about Gettysburg. <laughs> Never been there. And he had no map that told him anything about it. The map of uh, Adams County, Pennsylvania, didn't even have the round tops on it. Uh, didn't have Cemetery Hill, nothing. Just had roads and railroads and towns and people's names along the highways. So um, so that's the, that's the plan. That's the plan. And what happens um, is that Meade orders John Reynolds who is commanding the left wing of the army. He is in command of not only his own first corps, but General Howard's 11th corps, and then General Sickles' third corps. And uh, Meade orders him to move to Gettysburg. And then he writes him a letter and Meade does, writes, Ren writes um, uh, Reynolds a letter on the 30th of June. And I, I, I tell you, you'll get a kick out of this. I, I, uh, I did a lot of work in the National Archives on, in all the core papers, Army core papers, and the Quartermaster General's papers. And um, I was in the 11th core papers, and I pulled out an envelope in this big uh, archival box, and it read on the cover, contents taken from the pockets of Major General John F. Reynolds, July 1, 1863. And of course, Reynolds is killed in this. So they took this out of his pockets. It got in the 11th Corps papers because they wanted to show all the dispatches Reynolds had to General Howard so he would know what Reynolds knew. But in this group of papers was a letter from George Meade, all in George Meade's handwriting. So Meade sat down and composed this himself because he and Reynolds were very close. And he tells Reynolds that he is to uh, move forward and to quote, get on their roads and routes of communication. That's the Chambersburg Pike. 
That's wherever all the communications are along that pike. He says, get on their roads and routes of communication. And, um, and in case of an advance in force, either against you, meaning Reynolds at Gettysburg or Howard back at Emmitsburg, you must fall back to that place. And I will reinforce you from the core nearest you, which are Sickles and Slocum. Uh, and then he says, please get all the information you can and post yourself up in the roads and routes of communication of the enemy. Now that's pretty clear what Meade is asking him to do. Well, that sort of operation requires, of course, Reynolds to use his entire corps. It's about 13,000 troops. What does Reynolds do that morning? He's an impulsive guy. He leaves Marsh Creek, which is a, a, a location crossroads about five miles north of, three miles north of Emmitsburg. He leaves that, um, that site and moves up the Emmitsburg Road uh, early in the morning, but with only one division. He has three divisions in that corps. And um, the other two divisions follow him more than an hour behind. And Reynolds goes all the way up there. He's then approached by uh, messengers from John Buford, a cavalryman whose division uh, is positioned west of Gettysburg. It's obviously just reconnaissance out there. But it turns out Buford is involved in a fight west of Gettysburg with elements of A.P. Hill's Corps of Lee's Army. And Reynolds takes that division out there, tries to aid John Buford. And as he's setting his one regiment of each brigade into line, a bullet hits him in the back of the head around 1045 in the morning of July 1, and he's killed instantly. And finally, during that morning when Abner Doubleday brings up his third division, and uh, along with the second division, he is informed that Reynolds has been killed. Now he's the senior commander. And it's here again, uh, it took me a long time to research a book like this, but I, uh, I'm a great believer in, in sending out queries to ephemera collectors. You never know what they got. And these are not things you could just go to a repository and, you know, get a box out and take a look. This is a hit and miss thing. But I sent a lot of queries out to book de or, uh, ephemera dealers asking if they'd ever sold letters written by staff officers of uh, senior commanders in the Army of the Potomac. One fellow remarked, uh, yeah, I have. I sold a nine page letter to a friend of mine not too long ago. And it's all about Gettysburg. And I said, well, who is he? He says his name is uh, John Slagle, the writer, and he was a staff officer to Abner Doubleday. And I go, oh, wow, uh, where can I reach this fellow? You know, well, the long and short of it, I got a hold of him in Southern California and asked him, uh, I've heard you have that. Would you mind sharing it? And um, he says, no, that's fine. So he sent me a uh, a photocopy of it. And here's, here's this man. He's the judge advocate to, um, to, to Doubleday. And they're there on the battlefield. And he's next to Doubleday when Doubleday hears that Reynolds is killed. And he says, Doubleday was seriously taken aback by that. And he almost didn't know what to do. And he said, he turned to me and he says, I don't know what Reynolds meant to do here. See, the whole, he, Reynolds, it, Reynolds had told him, had told Doubleday before he even left Marsh Creek that we're going up there. If the enemy collects in front of me, we're to simply re return to Emmitsburg, withdraw to Emmitsburg. So now he sees what he's doing. He goes, I don't know what he, plan he plans to do. He says, it looks like he wants to defend this place. Well, as a make a long story short, he brings up both of those divisions. Uh, he calls for General Howard to come to his aid. Howard does. And um, by the end of that morning, you've got all of the First Corps 
uh, west of Gettysburg. You've got the 11th Corps north of Gettysburg. They're being assaulted by two different corps of Lee's army, A.P. Hills from the west and Dick Ewell's from the north. And um, the line they hold is that the, the 11th Corps and the 1st Corps hold is absolutely untenable. Its flanks are exposed um, to the attack to attacks from the from the north and from the from the east and from the west. And before the day is over, both of those corps are routed and um, uh, flee to uh, what we know as Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill, east of Gettysburg. And this is an example of an error in judgment. Um, he sh Reynolds should have brought up the entire corps, and his his job was not to get involved in a fight out there, and yet he did. And um, that's how it begins for poor George Meade. And what, the, sadly for him, that that caused him to have to abandon the Pipe Creek line. And it's also important to mention here that it's it was not just Reynolds whose corps moved forward, followed by General Howard's 11th Corps on the left. That, that morning of July 1, Meade also ordered General uh, uh, Slocum, who commands the 12th Corps, to move north to a town called Two Taverns, just beyond Littlestown, Pennsylvania. He then ordered General Sykes's Fifth Corps to move to Hanover, Pennsylvania, uh, and then ordered the Sixth Corps, commanded by John Sedgwick, to move to uh, Manchester. Now, Manchester is 32 miles from Gettysburg. Uh, Hanover is 20 plus miles from Gettysburg. Two Taverns is about 14 miles from Gettysburg. And um, uh, Reynolds Corps, of course, is west of Gettysburg, along with uh, Howard's north of Gettysburg. But think, there's no one to come to their support. So you know, see, Meade did not have any intention of any battle being fought. This was a line he set up to try to um, lure the enemy toward Pipe Creek. Again, as this map shows here, the, the uh, map... Uh, 9.1, you can see Meade orders uh, from um, Manchester, uh, the 6th Corps to move to Union Mills and then up the um, uh, Baltimore Pike toward Gettysburg. He orders Sykes to move west from Hanover to Gettysburg. He orders the 2nd Corps to move to Gettysburg uh, early, in the, early in the afternoon of July, uh, of July 1. And um, the entire line that he wanted to set up is now being abandoned. And what, 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 what causes even more problems for Meade is that having to do that uh, takes him 22 miles away from his base of supply. And he had systematically on the morning of July 1 set up, gotten permission from the quartermaster general, Montgomery Miggs, to, to, for, uh, 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 have maintain a supply base at a town called Westminster in Carroll County, Maryland. And that uh, little town had a rail line to it from Baltimore, the Western Maryland Railroad, that also uh, moved just a little, about 10 miles uh, w uh, west of Westminster um, to, a plant, to a town called Union Bridge, and um, it, it was perfect for s supplying the army. It only had one track, though, and that meant you had to line up your, your freight trains, uh, five, one behind the other, five of them, and go as a caravan up there with supplies. <laughs> and General Herman Haupt was the one in command of that, uh, a railroad uh, engineer himself. Um, and he had these trains backed up uh, in, in convoys of five, all going to Westminster. He was unloading it each, each time a convoy was unloaded at Westminster, they were unloading 2,000 tons of supplies. And they do this five times a day to try to feed this army. And um, sadly, 
because Meade had to move everything to Gettysburg, uh, he was now 22 miles from that supply base. And because he had to fortify Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill, um, it was under Confederate attack throughout the entire time he was at Gettysburg. So the Baltimore Pike to Westminster was shut down. So even though you're unloading 2,000 tons a trip and you're doing this five times a day, you can't, they can't get the supplies to the Army. And um, as a consequence, you have horses that are not fed, mules that are not fed, men that are not fed. Uh, Meade, from the time he took command until July 1, sent three different orders to the quartermaster general, uh, ordering a total of 51,000 pair of shoes. That's half the army, his shoes. That's before the battle began. And there's no indication those shoes ever arrived. They never seemed to get to those troops. Uh, in fact, during the pursuit of Lee, uh, O.O. Howard wrote to um, Rufus Ingalls, the quartermaster of the Army of the Potomac. He says, my men need shoes. One half of my Army Corps is barefoot. Now, being uh, barefoot troops is one thing. Hungry troops is one thing. But a hungry horse is another. Uh, Army regulations required horses to be fed a 14 pounds of oats and 14 pounds of hay a day. Now you have, Meade has 60,000 horses in that army. Uh, none of these horses have been fed. You don't feed a horse for three days, the horse turns, turns lame. Um, he, he gets seriously weak. And if you let that go too much longer, the horse will collapse. Um, and these, many of these animals simply were not even capable of moving the field artillery. And um, there were letters as Meade pursued Lee uh, between uh, Meade and his corps commanders where they're saying, we can't get the guns over the South Mountain Range. Our horses won't, won't pull. Uh, what 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 can we do? Where can we get animals? And I'll tell you what, the Army of the Potomac, because of the, the crisis with with the animals, they were they were sending telegrams to um, uh, st horse stations in as far away as Chicago, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. Uh, Baltimore, New York, uh, Boston, trying to get horses to the army. Now, of course, none of those would ever arrive in time. But the army just became crippled, totally crippled. And yet, um, Meade, uh, after the fighting is over at Gettysburg, he mounts a pursuit of Lee along a parallel course, meaning he moved on the east face of the South Mountain Range while Lee, while Lee is moving on the west side of the South Mountain Range. And all your army theorists, military theorists in the 19th century and today would tell you that to pursue an enemy along a parallel course, uh, particularly where the land is rough and where you have mountains, is the thing to do. It gets you there faster, and it also causes the enemy to move faster. And you want a defeated enemy moving faster because he suffers disintegration. A, a defeated army does. Um, and um, but so he pursued properly. It's just that um, uh, no one had been fed. None of the horses had been fed. Most of the men had not been fed, and. Um, uh, but nevertheless, Meade gets that army in front of Lee, just south of Hagerstown, just east of Hagerstown and south of Hagerstown um, by the uh, 10th of, of July. And um, I mean, it's a remarkable effort, absolutely remarkable effort um, for which he has gotten absolutely no credit whatsoever. 
And it all started because of an error in judgment. And, um, and that precipitated the, 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 the movement of the army uh, to Gettysburg and away from its supply base. And um, uh, it's a wonder the army was in, intact at all, frankly. Given the, the, the fact that that parallel pursuit is understood to be the correct strategy, um, why was there no or little response to the complaint, complaint of, of not pursuing Lee aggressively enough? You mean by George Meade? Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, my feeling is probably uh, the, the reason he doesn't say anything other than correspond with Henry Halleck that, you know, when Halleck says, we want you to make force marches, Meade says, we have been making force marches ever since this began, and we're still making force marches. Um, but Meade just did not think it appropriate for him to argue with the president of the United States. And, um, you know, he would listen to what they were saying, take it, so to speak. And if he totally felt this was unjustified, offer his resignation, which is what he did. And, and that's on multiple occasions. Is that right? Yes. Uh, he, he apparently, this is the first time he offered his resignation. He did it three more times throughout until the fall of uh, 1863. Um, but um, yeah, I, the, what else is a human being to do? Um, he did everything that he could possibly do to, um, to see that that, army got into a position where it confronted the enemy and, and was in a position to attack, to do something. But, you know, I have to agree with the historian Edwin Coddington on this. He made the remark in his great book on the Gettysburg campaign that it appeared to George Meade that the Army of the Potomac was simply no longer an instrument capable of confronting that enemy, particularly where the enemy had entrenched itself along a ridge, a, a dominating ridge, uh, had all its field artillery there. And Meade's army would have to attack, if it attacked that position south of Hagerstown, it would have to cross a swollen stream and then nearly a mile and a half of rifle pits and artillery emplacements would be, uh, would be confronting him. And, uh, and his men. And he's, to do that would be suicidal, utterly suicidal. And so Meade um, and his corps commanders, there's the picture of the two tr the troops as they uh, appeared uh, right before Lee crossed the Potomac River. And um, it, the position Lee held there was absolutely um, uh, impregnable. So you, you have to, you know, you, and, and, but it's interesting, Meade actually just off, right, right off the cuff decided he was just going to try to attack. And some of his corps commanders uh, asked him if we could confer about it. And they did. And they came to the conclusion that this would not be justified. And rather, why don't we just make some forced reconnaissance efforts to see if there's a weak position. And they did that the next morning. And, um, uh, but could not find a place where they felt they could make a breach. And in the night, Lee slipped the army across the Potomac River. And I, I, Lee's uh, uh, operations here are, as I put in my retreat book, totally phenomenal. Um, uh, the, all through the pursuit of Lee and Lee's withdrawal from Gettysburg, it poured rain. It was the rain came down in just torrents. So much so that the Army of the Potomac, which was about uh, uh, waist deep at the most, when Lee's army forded it to get into Maryland, was now anywhere from 13 to 16 feet deep. And um, uh, the uh, uh, Meade, in developing this defense line you see in the map, on the, there the line on the left, um, uh, he also ordered his engineers to build a bridge 
uh, at Falling Waters. And you can see Falling Waters down here on the, the left side of the map. Uh, you'll see a um, uh, where the bridge is across the Potomac. That bridge, uh, those engineers put together by, in, by scratch in 68 hours. And that bridge was able to hold two Army Corps along with nearly 57 miles of uh, quartermaster and subsistence trains, wagon trains that went over that thing. I mean, imagine putting a bridge together from scratch in 68 hours that could do that. I mean, it's just phenomenal to me. And in order to put that bridge together, they had 28 pontoons that, that supported the bridge. And to make those pontoons uh, watertight, they melted tar off the roofs of barns. Wow. And um, yet in 68 hours, they were able to do that. Now that's that's just an incredible thing. I, I uh, you, you hardly have words to describe uh, that kind of effort, but that's what caused them to escape. Fascinating, fascinating, and, and so interesting to hear about your research and in reaching out to ephemera dealers <laughs> and, and their customers. And uh, it certainly it certainly bore fruit. Exciting for us to hear uh, that. Now, um, I, I think uh, Carrie is going to rejoin us, and I think she has a, a question or two as uh, as we conclude. Sure. All right. So a question to kind of wrap up. You did so much research on this, and we would like to know what was something that really surprised you in your research that you didn't maybe anticipate? Well, um, it in in researching the Mead book, there were certain things I really kind of had touched on in writing the book on the retreat from Gettysburg. One of the things I did in the retreat book was I, it was the first time I ever got an opportunity to see the quartermaster general's papers. And it, it's your quartermaster general and his subordinates who are the ones that dictate how the, uh, uh, equipment, ordnance, um, shoes, uh, stockings, trousers, shirts uh, uh, are sent to the army, and they're the the forage for all the animals, and equipment for all the field artillery. All of that is is goes through the quartermaster general, the commissaries of subsistence. Uh, also play a role in that they're the ones that bring up the food where the soldiers eat. And um, I did a lot of work in the quartermaster general's papers. And in those papers, uh, for purposes of George Meade's army, um, there's one report to Montgomery Miggs, the quartermaster general, and it's from the assistant quartermaster general. And he recounts the sheer number of horses in this report that the army lost in the Gettysburg campaign. It lost 1,900 horses in the fighting at Gettysburg. But altogether, the total number of horses lost were 14,000. Wow. Now, you, you just take... You've got 12,000 plus horses that were lost in that pursuit. Now, that's how bad they were. That's that's the sheer, that, that number tells you how, how un, ill-fed, unfed those animals were. And not all those 14,000 or 12,000 died. Many of them did. But a lot of them just became so lame, they just had to turn them out. Uh, or collapsed and had to be destroyed. Um, I mean, it was a, a holocaust for the animals. And um, people often ask me, well, but, you know, wasn't Lee's army in the same shape as, you know, these are, they were all supposed to be barefoot, weren't they? You know, I, I hear this all the time. And the answer is, I mean, they went through the same rain, same kind of mud, that's for sure. Um it was difficult for them like it was for Meade's army, but there's a big difference and it's this. 
when Lee's army came on the battlefield at Gettysburg, uh, they had just won on July 1st. Two of those corps had just won. The remainder elements of the army, mostly James Longstreet's first corps, uh, came on the next day way more deliberately. And all three of Lee's army corps came on the, on the field deliberately. They weren't hurried. Um, as they came on the field, each one of those army corps, they mostly had three to, two to three divisions. Each of the divisions of each corps set up their own hospital sites three miles behind where they believed they would be fighting. And around those hospital sites, they were able to bring that division's quartermaster trains as well as its subsistence trains, which mostly consisted of a meal for the troops, but also cattle on the hoof, hogs, sheep. Uh, and so three miles behind the battle lines were all the supplies for each division of Lee's army. So you see the difference. His men were able to be fed, Lee's men, meagerly, but they were able to be fed. The animals were fed uh, regularly, meagerly maybe, but nevertheless fed enough to keep them going, uh, where poor George Meade's were simply not. That's the difference. And what's ironic about this is that here, here's a Union Army fighting on its home turf with Baltimore and, and Philadelphia and Washington at, at their backs, and they're in worse shape than the enemy. And it shows you that the, what happens in an error of judgment in a, in a campaign like this, um, it also shows the, the power of, the, of logistics um, in, in making sure your army is fed and clothed, equipped, and um, um, given the, the, the proper care. It just has to be before you can fight anything. Absolutely. Well, thank you. This has been fantastic. Um, we have a link to Ken's book in the chat and you'll want to check that out. Of course, there is so much more there that we could not get to tonight. Um, and it's a really good look at Gettysburg from the Union perspective and you will have a new appreciation for General Meade. So make sure you check that out. Uh, we're also going to put in the chat a link to Kent's organization, Witnessing History. Oh, thank you. Thank check you. That out. Check that out. Thank you. We're, we're in the same business, guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we wanted to tell you, too, I'm going to actually switch this here so you can kind okay. of see behind me a little bit. We have a new print that was just released in October that oh. commemorates Gettysburg. This is original art that we commissioned the artist is Larry Stewart, and this is a beautiful print. You can get it framed or unframed. They are signed and uh, numbered by the artist, and it is silk, uh, silk screen printed. And we also just came out with some smaller items, too. We have an 11 by 14 smaller print, and we have a postcard size print with some information on the back and stickers and magnets. You can find all of those at thepursuitofhistory.org. And you can actually find it right on the History Camp website if you just click on shop on the top uh, navigation bar. But we'll put a link to that in the chat as well. Now, if you enjoyed this tonight, there are a few things you can do to keep this uh, going. We'll tell your friends about it. Sign up for our email list if you're not already on there. And consider making a small donation to The Pursuit of History. That's the nonprofit that keeps these coming to you every week. Uh, next week, we will be speaking with Daniel Gagnon about the Salem witch trials and the uh, woman, Rebecca Nurse, who was accused of being a witch. She was tried, she was executed, and many years later, she was exonerated. So we are going to take a look at that journey. And everyone is always interested in the Salem Witch Trials. So we hope that you will join us for that as well. Thank you so much, Kent. And thank you, everyone. Have a thank good Thank you. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Lee, thank you very much.